got the whole, a large amount of the 1978 year behaving better than I can ever recall him behaving. <laughs> We're almost going to have to shut down the Toyota and Daihatsu warehouse today. And that in many ways is a reflection of John's life and his wonderful ways. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have much to celebrate. We have uh, a celebration of a man who had great courage, was very determined, was a fighter, was an inspiration with the manner with which he lived his life. He was very, very proud of his achievements and, and always knew he was a legend. Most people prefer someone to tell him, but John would remind you. And he was very proud to be married uh, for about 18 years, which is fantastic. Uh, John Winston Coote was born in Kansas in 1960 to Elva and Gordon Coote. And uh, the headmaster mentioned a moment ago, Elva Coote. For those of you who went to prep school or even at senior school, could not forget Elva Coote. She was a formidable energy, a tall lady, very, very determined that John would do the best he could. And uh, the, the number of times Mrs Coote showed interest in all of us at different times was extraordinary. And she was very different to Gordon Coote who was uh, meek and mild and uh, just went along with the flow. In fact, between the two of them, they provided John with a, with a wonderful first 20 years. For the Coote family, uh, it was financially very tough for them to bring them to Trinity Grammar School and to think that John's had such a wonderful schooling here, a great life and has a full church, I think they should, from where they sit, be very proud of themselves also. Some six years later, John, of course, went to Trinity Prep School and I, I looked around the church today and there's quite a few boys that will remember those days vividly. And uh, earliest memories, Jeremy Smith uh, sent me a note and wanted to be remembered with many other old boys today, of this very polite, courteous, well-dressed boy who was in stark contrast to most of the people around him, who had chewed up ties, broken boaters, and who would put fiberglass on their boaters as a self-defense mechanism if there was any trouble to be had on the buses. But John felt safe at Trinity Prep School in particular. He had very happy years at the school. He was a winger. Uh, and of course, uh, in those days, you'd wear a piece of foam on each side of your shorts, inside your shorts, which didn't help him look any more bulky than he was. And if you wanted to make a name for yourself in rugby, you'd, you'd have a shot at Cootie because uh, you'd be able to knock him out pretty quickly. Um, but afternoons were always punctuated by, by Elva Coote and Jan, who used to uh, wait at the school gate for John every day. And uh, we were always really impressed with that and uh, remember it very well. The second hymn today is Brightly Gleams Our Banner. Now that was a hymn that was sung with great energy at the prep school in particular in the early days of Summer Hill. And um, so you need to sing out of your, out of your clothes when, that's, when that hymn comes on later because that was one of John's favourites. <coughs> John's transition to senior school, like for most boys who went to prep school, was a little bit tough because prep was just a really protected little world. And there were a couple of occasions early on in John's transition to senior school that a couple of boys tried it on him. Uh, but the previous reader, Jeff Colbert, uh, was appointed as a security guard, I think, in those early years, and there were a couple of occasions that issues were settled on the Oval, and John had no more trouble after that. Um, but he was just a very well-cared and loving boy that we all looked out for along the way. His nickname, of course, at Trinity was Bruiser, and um, for all of those who know him would know the irony in that. But there was a time, uh, and I understand this is more than an allegation, that this happened in about year 10, uh, in a class with Dave Polden, that uh, the class had incited the need for a fight between Dave Polden and John Cook. Uh, talk about the Titans in action. And uh, so they shaped up for a while and eventually Dave Polden said, John, will you just hit me so we can get on with this? <laughs> and they both had a punch each, a bruise each, and they ended, they ended as gentlemen, as friends. And, and we think that that's where the, the term bruiser came from. But John was also good for a loan at school. Um, if you wanted a loan, you either went to the Crusaders, because apparently they meant well, and it always helped you, or you'd go to John Coote. And somehow John was always flush with funds, and he would lend you money, and you'd pay him back. Uh, he, was, he was a banker of sorts at school. He also sang in the school choir and cut an album with the school called Let the Boys Sing. Um, and so if you, I'm not sure that that's on the top 20 list right now, but if you're able to get a copy, John was singing. In that, in that choir. 
Within four years of John leaving Trinity Grammar School, both his parents passed away. One from cancer, one from leukaemia, and both died at the hospital John died. So the, the genetic formation that John was born with clearly had de determined a destiny for him. And certainly in the conversations I've had with him in the last, in the last months, I think he was clear about that, and that's why he, he really had a go with everything he did. In my hospital visits, whenever he wasn't just talking about die, which drove me nuts, die, um, <laughs> he spoke about dot. And I kept saying to him, who is this dot? He keeps saying dot. So I got this phone number, and I rang this incredible 94-year-old lady who sits right over there, and she was actually the midwife uh, that, in giving birth to John's sister, Jan, who's here today, and sat with Elva at that time. When Elva got un was unwell, she asked Dot to look after Jan and keep an eye on John. And I can tell you that lady's been doing that ever since. And I, I've seen some wonderful little notes from John that he wrote to Dot uh, when he'd been a misbehaving young 20-year-old, saying, I know you're watching. And he wrote it in modified cursive, uh, which was what we were forced to write in, uh, in those days. But his notes were about his inability in his 20s to manage his budget, but Doc managed it with him, and he just always looked to her with great comfort. Of course, his career, uh, and many people are here from his career, but his first career was as a taxi driver. And I have to tell you, that was a short-lived but celebrated career. Because we grew up in the era of the Dodgem car. You may recall that that's a, a, an implement that you drive into people and then drive off. John took that approach to taxi driving. <laughs> and uh, Dot called him in and gave him one of those talks that I think Dot had to give him quite on a regular basis, saying, you know, John, I just don't think this career is for you. Um, but to his, to his good luck, he had a neighbour who offered him some part-time work at Dunlops many years ago. And um, uh, he gave him a part-time job over Christmas. John did a really honest job was very trusted and was given a job and, and was there for about 14 years. And he won several awards, one of which was the No Time Off Award, and uh, which is probably better than some of the, the school performances that if some of the people in this room, in this church. Um, but he, he worked afternoon shifts, and of course that's where he met Di. And Di tells me he was very shy for some time, which would have been a really, it was just a short moment of his life. <laughs> and he just couldn't quite work out how to, to manage this um, courtship with Di. So a lot of the, the Barbara and Shirley, who I think are here today, did a lot of matchmaking to get that sorted out. And of course, sorted out it was. And they got married on September 30th, 1995. And you'll notice in your booklet on the second page a wonderful photo of John. And when Di looked at that photo the other day, she said to me, he just couldn't wait. Well, I didn't want to go any further than that. But obviously he'd gotten over his shyness. But I understand also he was not a handyman. And uh, when both sets of neighbours were almost in skin diver suits because of flooding going on in their properties, it was due to a leaking pipe at John's Coots place that we thought wasn't much of a problem. So handyman work wasn't his strength, but certainly his time at Dunlop was and his time at Toyota was. I can tell you, for those colleagues that are here from Toyota, he spoke very highly of you um, in the time I spoke to him in, in the last months. And he had his pride of place Bulldogs jersey with, with all the signatures that, that was arranged. And I understand you took him to some games. And, you know, he obviously loved you all, and you know that. But of course, then came the time when John became quite ill. And he, he made a call to me and said, I want you to tell the boys about a year that uh, I'm unwell. And we did that, and we've maintained a close contact around that all the way through. He was really grateful for everyone who came to visit him. He continually reaffirmed his love for you, Di, his love for Jan, and his love for Don and your families. Uh, he, knew, he knew what he had, but he kept telling me he was going to fight it. And I think for those who were seeing him in the last couple of weeks, no one at Calvary Hospital could believe he was still alive. And every, every visit I ended in the morning, each morning, I said to him, you know we all love you, and he'd say yes up until the last few days. And I said, you know you're a legend, he said, yes I am. And then he reverted to thumbs up in the last few days because he couldn't speak anymore. And the last day he couldn't put his thumb up to acknowledge he was a legend, and I knew then 
Um, if John Coote couldn't acknowledge he was a legend, then his time on earth was finishing. So when I look at the chapel today, uh, uh, en enormous memories for many of us old boys here. At the, that the affection that's held for John and the love that's held for John here. That the manner with which John played the cards he was given, he played them really well. Uh, he loved people and they loved him back in, in bucket loads. And, and John, we, we would wish that you say hello to your parents that you haven't seen for so very long. And that you say hello to the boys that were lost in 1978 so far. And we will reassure you, all of us here in our different vantage points, that we will maintain the legend of John Risden Coote. Ringo Pagia! Come, 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 come